Good afternoon and welcome to Lunch with League. I'm so pleased to have uh, so many guests with us today to join our members today for what is going to be a great program. My name is Gloria Chun Hu. I'm sitting here on behalf of Diane McNutt, the president of the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara, who unfortunately is unable to be with us due to, due to illness. Uh, the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara serves the cities of Melpitas, Morgan Hill, and uh, Gilroy, as well as San Jose and Santa Clara. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan but political organization. Our purpose is to encourage informed and active participation in government and to influence public policy through education and advocacy. We do not support or oppose any political party or political candidate, but we do study issues. And the purpose of our monthly lunch with Lee is to host a speaker who will provide us and share with us information and ideas that will help us shape and broaden our understanding of critical issues in our community. This month, I'm so pleased uh, to welcome Rod Dearden Sr. who will be speaking on the climate crisis has a remedy if we act now. It's a, it's a hopeful message filled with great information. As many of you know, Rod, uh, Rod Dearden Sr. is a well-known name in Silicon Valley. He's had over 20 plus years of public service on the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, providing great leadership there, and is chairman of our VTA board. Perhaps he is also best known for the work he's done in transportation. He is the Executive Director Emeritus of the Meta Transportation Institute, and as we all know, the namesake of the Dearden train station in San Jose. He has truly been a champion for us in transportation. He is a longtime environmental advocate who has chaired more than 100 local uh, to international transportation and environmental programs. This is something he has been very committed to for a very long time. Today, he's going to describe for us why the climate crisis is a code red for humanity, and also go into some of the actions that he believes we can and should take now to protect our future. Please note that after Rod's presentation, um, we're hoping that Barbara Marshman will be able to uh, sit in and ask questions. We're having some technical problems, but uh, the, some of you provided questions to us in, in advance as part of your registration. Uh, so if you have questions uh, while Rod is speaking, go ahead and enter them into chat and we'll get to them at the end of Rod's presentation. So please now join me and give us a warm virtual welcome to Rod Dearden Sr. Rod, thank you for joining us today. Gloria, thank you very, very much for that nice introduction. It's the kind of an introduction that uh, my mother would believe and nobody else would. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Let me uh, apologize to you one time. I had a close encounter of the wrong time kind with the man with the scalpel and lost a vocal cord about 10 years ago. So I have to speak with one vocal cord, which is a very dirty trick to play on an old politician. And so I, I croak a little bit and I apologize and sometimes cough and I won't do it again. I won't apologize again, but if it happens, but it, if it, ha it happens. Now, let me uh, let me get seriously into this. And first of all, thanking you, Gloria, and, and thanking all of those who put this nice program together today. I hope uh, I hope Diane is is uh, feeling better and I'll look forward to being with Barbara uh, if she can click in when the time comes. She's a dear friend uh, of long standing. Uh, the uh, presentation today comes from about 40 years of serious study of the subject. I was president of the American Public Transit Association in the, the mid 1990s. And, uh, and, and was assigned then to be the chair of the transit research branch of the National Research Council. And after a year of uh, serving as the chair, uh, they uh, let you do your study as, as the chair's study. And I decided to do a study of climate change, with the causes of it. And they didn't want me to do it because most of the money at that time was coming from highway sources. And finally I demanded and they, they let me get it done. And we did the study called the uh, um, Combating Climate Change Through a Sustainable Transportation Policy, uh, Mass Transportation. And the study uh, came out and it, it declared without equivocation 
when climate change was occurring, this was in about 1998, climate change was occurring, it was caused by human beings, uh, and we had to move pretty quickly to get something done about it. Now, at the same time, the United Nations was looking more seriously, and others of you, indeed, the League was, uh, looking more seriously at, at the growing crisis. Uh, we were seeing inclement weather that was un, unusual and, and so on. And so the issue had become uh, a cause celeb. And now it has grown to the point of being the cause celeb in the world. And it's the only thing that we can, almost all are unified uh, in, in support of. Uh, only one or two countries are still dragging their feet. Uh, those are primarily the oil exporting countries. So what I'm going to go through with you today is scientific information. This is material developed by the best scientists in the world, Nobel laureates, the research branches of our great universities, uh, scientists that aren't attached to any kind of an outside source of funding like petroleum or coal or whatever. Uh, so it's, it's agreed to by over 99% of the researchers in the world. And, and at the end of the material, I'll give you a list of the sources you can go to in order to confirm the data in case you want to use this presentation yourself. And my, my fervent hope is that you will capture this, this PowerPoint. I'll, have, I'll send you a copy personally if, if you'd like and adjust it to your own use. You can modify it and get out into the community and make the presentations in order to protect the future for our children. So with that in mind, and recognizing that this is fact, it isn't conjecture, it's scientific fact, let me begin the presentation. And it's gonna go through a tough time at the beginning. And then at the end, we're gonna end with what we can do to save the future for our kids. So let's begin. Uh, thank you, Gloria. Next, Carol, okay. As I mentioned, this is scientific material uh, agreed to by the scientists of the world, and uh, it's, it's declaring a climate emergency. Next, please. Uh, the, the data that you're going to see says unequivocally, uh, climate change is happening now and is human caused. The impacts are already irreversible. Those impacts that we have now cannot be reversed within the next 100 years. So we have to stop climate change now so the impacts don't become worse. And then we do that by acting today, acting locally, acting internationally, and acting together to protect the future for our children. Next, please. Uh, these are the extinctions in the world that we can record clear back of 444 million years ago. Uh, to the very first one. And then the last extinction occurred 66 million years ago uh, when the, the big uh, uh, meteor hit uh, the Yucatan Peninsula down in Mexico, and it killed 76% uh, of all life on Earth. Uh, and uh, uh, what we have now on Earth is the evolution of the last 66 million years. And if you're a human, you think that that evolution is pretty good. Well, if we don't want to go through the sixth mass extinction then and have that evolution terminated, then we better get to it. Uh, the head of the uh, uh, biology department at Stanford University Medical School recently gave a speech to, uh, to the Rotary Club in San Jose. And she said without equivocation that we are in our sixth mass extinction now and must move, move very quickly in order to uh, reverse the effects and stop the effects. Well, I think she's right. So let's figure out a way to get this done quickly. And let's, go, let's talk now through what is actually occurring so you can answer the questions as, as you go through this presentation, if you choose to do so. Uh, climate change occurs when the sun's uh, heat, rays of, sun, of sunshine comes to the earth bounces off the earth and goes out into space. That's the way it had been going on for millennia after millennia. But unfortunately, we've been burning so much carbon-based fuel 
that a blanket of carbon has built up around the earth, carbon and other gases, but primarily carbon dioxide, has built up around the earth and the, so that the energy is bouncing off the earth now and bouncing off the inside of that blanket and bouncing back to earth. And that, that's cooking the earth. We're heating up the earth rather rapidly now in historic terms. And it's in, we just can't tolerate it as a planet. So uh, next, please. <coughs> you can use that quote. Somebody captured it in a presentation and, and put it in the, in, into this presentation. You can use that quote if you'd like. It's a, it's a factual statement. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll go on. Next, please. Now, this is a key one. For the last uh, several decades, the US, Russia, China, and the European community have had a research station in the Antarctic uh, drilling down through their five mile thick ice sheet and capturing the teeny tiny little bubble, bubbles on each level of ice going back 800,000 years. They analyzed the, the tiny bubbles in each of those levels uh, the amount of CO2 in, in each one of those bubbles. And that's what you see mapped here. Those are the high ones are, are uh, heating periods. The low ones are ice ages. And so you can see the ice ages and the heating periods and ice ages and heating periods going back. And the earth adjusts each time to bring us back into conformance until we are where we are now, where that red arrow points. We are twice as high in CO2 in the atmosphere as ever in the history, recorded history, 800,000 years on earth. We are four times as high uh, as, the, we're four times as high as the average. So that's, it's telling us something. It's a, a red flag and it's reminding us that we have to act now. Next, please. Well, that, uh, that CO2 in the atmosphere causes the effect of global warming, the bouncing back of the heat uh, back to the earth instead of letting it, letting it uh, distribute out to the universe. And so it, you can see that it becomes dramatic at mid-century last year, last uh, year, last uh, uh, century. And then it started to become obtuse as we relied more and more and more on carbon-based fuel to create energy. That's cars, trucks, planes, trains, uh, lawnmowers, leaf blowers. Uh, it includes uh, uh, the natural gas that we use vastly in our dwelling units and, and uh, employment locations and, and factories. It includes the coal that we use for creating uh, electricity and, and manufacturing coal, uh, cement and so on. And we've been doing that much more and more as the population on earth has increased so that the last five years on earth have been the hottest five years in the recorded history of the planet. Not just the hottest, but much, much higher than any time in the past. But these are the facts. This is what we, we know is happening now. And we have, to, we have to plan for if we're going to have a future. Next, please. Well, the heat buildup uh, on Earth caused by the uh, combustion of uh, carbon-based material uh, is coming from uh, primarily transportation. Now, this study was done by, uh, led by the University of California, Berkeley, and Lawrence Livermore Lab, and Scripps, and the best uh, scientists around, several Nobel laureates. And it, they declared that it's coming primarily from transportation, 38%. <clears throat> some from industry, but we can't do much about industry because industry has to be controlled by, uh, by governments. And they're trying pretty hard now, in California especially. Electric generation and electric importation, though, we can do something about. And that's another 23%. So that puts us up over 60% of the difficulty uh, coming from transportation and energy generation. The other ones, agriculture, residential, commercial, and so on, 
are, are relatively small amounts, we're not going to be able to get to, to a, a condition of, of uh, fighting uh, climate change by attacking only agricultural, residential, and so on. But we should do those too. But we have to address transportation, uh, industry, electric generation, and imports. And so my, my comments today are going to dwell on what we can control, you and me, at the local level. And that's transportation, electric generation, and, and imports, uh, the process of creating energy for your homes and so on. That's the 60% of the problem that we can handle. If we can't handle our 60%, then the rest of it doesn't matter. So it's this is a burden for you and me at the local level to handle. Next, please. Now, here's the solution. Cars are the real problem. The highest grams of CO2 per seat mile. This study was done, by the way, by a brilliant scientist from, from Canada uh, who was chair of the transportation board of the National Research Council. Uh, and uh, his name is actually on the bottom of this slide, but it doesn't come through here. And so cars are the other uh, major problem. Electric vehicles are attacking that. And uh, the projection is that by, by uh, 2030, 2035, 2040, the majority of the cars on the road are going to be electric. Air is, uh, is a real problem. Now that shows all of airlines. But short hop airlines are worse than automobiles in terms of pollution per seat mile. So, uh, so the, the, we need to get rid of short hop airlines. Those are just absolutely devastating with those big motors moving the, engine, the airplane up into the air and then only being at cruising altitude for a short time and then the big motors being used again to, to come down and, and land. Buses are not good. Diesel powered buses are not good. And fortunately, our transportation leaders across the nation are shifting over now in mass to electric and, and uh, hybrid buses. Uh, our, our BTA is, is doing it uh, right now. But the real solution is light rail, high-speed rail, uh, uh, other kinds of metro rail that the Caltrain system is being converted to electric rail right now. It's almost ready to go into, into operation. The, the new rolling stock is is in in San Francisco, and um, you can see them if you would like to look up uh, up the, at the maintenance facility, and you can see the new wires over the tracks for Caltrain. So they're in the process, and they'll be ready when the high speed rail system goes in to use the same tracks and the same electrification systems. So we're we're getting there, uh, but we've got to move faster. Next, please. Now this is the this is the red flag. When this article came out in 2018, uh, it was a, a summary of a speech by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. He was telling us at that time, and people weren't paying attention, that uh, science was telling him his uh, intergovernmental panel on, on climate change, which was headed by 72 Nobel laureates, by the way. At the, at the international level, was telling him that uh, climate change was out of control. We needed to do something about it immediately. Well, he, he came out and made it public in 2018. They indicated that in as little as 12 years, the worst impacts of climate change could become permanent. And we needed to work immediately against it. Well, we didn't do very much the first couple of years. People weren't listening. Then last year, he came out again and declared a code red. Now, code red is a legal term at the United Nations to, deter, to declare a, a state of emergency in regard to climate worldwide. Now, many of the countries of the world, including the United States, did declare a code red. Uh, only huh, we were a couple of years behind. But when President Biden became elected, he declared a code red for the United States. California has declared a code red. Most of the progressive countries of the world have done so. Uh, Russia has not, and a few others, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and but China has. Uh, so we we know now that it's a crisis. We know we have to work in consortium 
worldwide in order to fight the crisis or we'll all go down. So let's let's recognize that and move together uh, as a result of, of, uh, of that good research. Next, please. Uh, th what I've just told you is, is charted here. We are where the green line is. We're gonna have some serious impacts of climate change. We're gonna continue to have uh, uh, ac atmospheric uh, rivers uh, come across the country and we're gonna to continue to have high winds and we're continue to have uh, some flooding uh, because of what we've done already to the planet. But that will not get worse if we can combat climate change by 2030 to the point of having the atmosphere not become any warmer. If we don't take those actions though, the red line is the future and that red line is the line to oblivion. Next please. <clears throat> What's happening currently, you all know it. Food production is being disrupted around the equatorial area, clear around the globe. It's becoming impossible to create enough food to feed the people living in those areas. In addition, when that food gets short, there are fights, uh, inter intergovernmental fights, and it becomes impossible to sustain a population because of the, uh, the uh, mayhem that's occurring in the area. And that's what's causing the mass exodus of people from the central part of uh, our, our planet in the Americas. And you're seeing those people pile up against a fence in, uh, in the south part of the United States. And you're seeing the same thing happening with people taking terrible lifeboats and so on across the Mediterranean, trying to get into Europe. Um, well, that's not going to reduce. That's only going to increase as we have more and more climate change and less and less of an ability uh, for the countries of Central America and South America, Northern South America, to sustain themselves and to sustain their population. Uh, unexpected epidemic? Well, you don't have to talk about epidemics. We we are living that right now with, with COVID and, and uh, with all kinds of other epidemics that are being experienced now, all the way from dengue uh, fever to uh, uh, to uh, all kinds of other kind of awful things that we are not used to having up in the more moderate uh, climates as the uh, temperatures increase. Water shortages, it's only going to get worse. Uh, we're going to have an inability to sustain uh, Southern California uh, in the next 100 years. People that are living down in the deserts and area with all the golf courses and so on that have a nice weather, uh, they're not going to have just uh, nice weather. They're not going to have any water. Uh, so that's that's a serious situation if it gets worse. And then, of course, the, the extremes of weather. You know, why that's occurring is because the surface of the planet is heating up. Not a little bit, but a lot in a comparative terms. That's the surface of the ocean is heating up. Now, when that happens, then the water evaporates much more readily and goes up into clouds and becomes storm clouds. And when a lot of water evaporates a lot more than usual, then it goes up into those clouds with a lot of pressure behind it. And the winds then become much higher than in the past. And the result is then they gather together in an atmospheric river and they come over the land with a huge wind behind it and a whole lot more water than we're used to. And they dump that water then on the land when it bumps up against mountains and and, uh, and and collides with other clouds. And that's what we've been having uh, in, in California and across the country, especially the Eastern part of the country recently. So radically inclement weather, uh, the wildfires. Now, the wildfires are gonna continue to occur. We're gonna lose most of the foliage south of, of the central part of California. And that's just the way it's gonna be. There's no way in the world uh, to protect that those forests um, with any kind of surety uh, over the longer term, uh, unless we can reverse this terrible climate change issue. And of course, as the polar ice caps melt, uh, we're going to have massive flooding. Uh, I don't know how in the world we're going to be able to protect uh, our own area 
around the Bay Area, and we're rich. Uh, and we're, so we have the opportunity of putting up high dikes and so on, something like the Netherlands. But the countries like Bangladesh and so on that are not rich are going to go underwater. And that then is going to cause another whole cycle of immigration from those poor people leaving their flooded farmlands and so on, looking for places to live. So we have to be used, we have to get ready for that. And, and you know, humanitarianism suggests that we're going to have to accept our responsibility for that displaced population. Uh, we can't just lock the door. Next, please. Here's an old buddy from Sanford, Hal Harvey, and he tells us the way forward. Next, please. We have to transform the power grid completely from anything that's controlled, uh, that is created by, by carbon-based fuel. That's petroleum, that's wood, that's coal. Completely terminate that combustion and instead feed the power grid with electricity created from uh, sustainable sources. Electrify everything. Uh, in our home here, uh, we're, I, I'm a retired politician. I'm not rich. I have to tell you that very sincerely. I was lucky to have a home in Silicon Valley. So using second mortgages and, uh, and, uh, and assistance in grants and uh, tax credits from the government, we have two Teslas, we have 45 solar panels on our roof, and we're net positive to the grid, which means we don't pay for electricity. What that does then is it pays for all of our transportation costs uh, because the electric that we generate is not, there's no cost. It's paid for by, by God uh, from, from, the, uh, from the sun. And the result of that is that our electric cars, by virtue of the pay uh, of the payments saved uh, uh, from not having to buy gasoline and not having to do any maintenance, the electric cars don't require maintenance. They will pay for themselves in seven, eight, nine, ten years. The batteries last twelve years, so those cars will pay for themselves within the life of the car, completely pay for themselves. And so it's it's economical. And it's also uh, uh, earth saving. And we need to do it very rapidly as, as Hal is indicating here. Um, I, I encourage you to, uh, to look at his energy innovation uh, material. Uh, he, he really has a, the right idea on the way forward. Next, please. So here's the solutions. Uh, High-speed rail, metro, commuter rail, light rail, Electric and hybrid buses, electric hybrid cars, electric and manual bicycles, scooters, and walking. That's the way forward in terms of transportation. Now, I'm not saying that you don't get to do personal driving. Hybrid cars, electric cars are, are the most uh, economical and, the, I might add, the, the most fun cars to drive. But we've got to get away from anything that's based on, on carbon. Next, please. Uh, this is the, the, the same situation with buildings. Uh, we need to have home and backyard solar panels. Now, let me share something there. When we put the solar panels in on our roof uh, 12 years ago, they were 9% efficient, meaning that they captured 9% of the energy from the sun and made it into electricity. The current panels being installed across the world are between 20 and 25% efficient, efficient, meaning you can have three times fewer, one third the, the panels and still get the same amount of energy. Or you can have the same amount of panels and create three times as much energy and share that back to the, to the uh, uh, electric company uh, so that they don't have to buy it from anybody else. Uh, solar panels are really a good thing to do. And with the battery powered, uh, storage uh, battery walls that are being put in now by, by Tesla and others, uh, you can become completely independent from the grid uh, for long periods of time if you would like to, and that will protect you whenever PG&E decides they're going to have a, a shutdown because of high winds or, or whatever. 
uh, the battery walls will protect you and allow you to run your, your important uh, utilities uh, during a blackout. Uh, if you can't put the solar panels on your roof, and remember, it isn't an affordability issue because you get all sorts of incentives and tax credits uh, and, and energy savings so that pay for it. Uh, if you can't put them on your roof, then uh, you can get, uh, uh, you can purchase sustainable, sustainably generated electricity from your uh, aggregators. They're called energy aggregators, and they sell the energy through the wires that PG&E allows them to use uh, at uh, about the same price as regular energy. It used to be a little bit more expensive, but it's coming down now. And, and so you can have only sustainably generated electricity coming to your house if you go to your electric aggregator and, and they'll uh, sell that to you. And remember to insulate your home to, so it doesn't lose energy coming through the walls and, and the ceilings. Eliminate gas heating, fireplaces, and other, other kinds of things. No burning woods. The only time you should ever burn wood now is when it's raining outside. If it's raining outside, you can burn the wood because the rain captures the, the carbon and takes it right back down into the soil and it becomes fertilizer. But if, it is, if it's not raining, don't burn wood. It, it's toxic and it, it hurts the planet. Uh, if you need background on this, the Air Quality Management District, Metropolitan Transportation Commissions, uh, will, and the, and the numbers are at the end of the presentation, will give you the background and will give you access to the grant programs that help you to do these things. Next, please. Now, this is, gives you an idea of what we're doing. This is the high-speed rail system for the state of California. It's almost completed in the Central Valley. That's 171 miles from Merced to, uh, uh, to Bakersfield. And then at Chowchilla, uh, just south of Merced, it takes off to the west and goes under the Pacheco Pass in tunnels. You can see the tunnels there, uh, 15, one 15 miles long. And it comes out at Gilroy. There's an interchange station at Gilroy, and I'll show you what's interchanged in just a minute. And then it, it joins the Caltrain system and it goes in the Caltrain system all the way up through San Jose and San Francisco. And, and uh, that system has been approved. It's being funded now. It's, it's going to take a lot of money, but it's what we have to do if we're going to be solving the problem. Europe has done this. They're all done. They, they are still extending. The, the, the biggest high-speed rail line uh, under construction in Europe right now is the one from London to Birmingham and Leeds, and it's costing four almost four times as much per mile as our system in the Central Valley. Yet they're going ahead with it with enthusiasm. And so we can build ours. It is being built, and we we're all ready and have done the studies and are doing the planning now uh, to welcome it when it gets into Gilroy and up through the the peninsula. Next, please. This is what it's going to be greeting. Uh, you can see the high-speed rail uh, line coming through the middle of it. Well, it's, it's going to be greeting uh, the Amtrak. It's going to be greeting Caltrain and Metrolink. Uh, it's, it's, it's the Capital Corridor train that goes up to Sacramento. It's going to be uh, greeting it there in San Jose. And it's going to be greeting the whole rail network, which is being developed now in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties that are uh, leading into the station at Gilroy so that um, those, those folks will have an opportunity of using electrically powered commuter rail uh, to, Gil to the Gilroy station and exchanging with either high-speed rail or Caltrain to come up into the San Jose, San Francisco area. So we're doing it right here. It's just a matter of getting it done now. Next, please. Now that slide didn't transfer, but it shows what we're doing in Santa Clara County. I'll talk it to, through with you uh, very quickly, and then I'm happy to answer questions about it. It shows the uh, commuter rail system, which I mentioned to you just a moment ago. In fact, let's go back uh, one slide, two slides, two slides, please, if we could. Oh, no, one slide, one more, 
one back there. It, it, what it does, it shows uh, the, the uh, commuter rail systems that uh, we talked about. It shows the, the development of BART coming down through San Jose now, and it's built now down to Berrius uh, Station, and it's under construction under San Jose in the tunnel and coming up in, in Santa Clara. It shows the uh, light rail system. We now have about 50 miles of the light rail system done uh, with another 100 miles, uh, uh, 80 miles planned. Uh, and that's, uh, that's under construction. And all of that is electrically powered now. Then it, it shows buses. Uh, the bus system is being converted to electric and hybrid buses. And it, it, then it shows the interconnect of all of those at the Deerdon Station and at the Mineta International Airport. Uh, where we can get people then most conveniently uh, by electrically powered transportation to those interchange stations and then to uh, uh, airports throughout the world or to transportation systems throughout the Western United States by Amtrak and high-speed rail. So as I said, we're doing it right. We just need the funding. A big step in that direction was taken by President Biden when he was able to get the infrastructure bill passed uh, last fall, uh, $1.4 trillion uh, to build the transportation systems and the electric generation systems of the future. 66 billion of that is set for high-speed rail and high-speed rail is back in Washington now competing uh, for that. And we're told already that we're gonna get a major chunk of it because we're the most advanced high-speed rail system in North America. So next, please. This is what you can do personally. First of all, become a climate ambassador. Uh, you get out there and talk to your neighbors, make it part of your mantra to, to uh, tell your family, your friends, your neighbors, your church buddies, your, your uh, social program act activists and, and uh, environmental activists, tell them about this and how urgent it is. Uh, put those concerns into your everyday conversations. We have buttons prepared uh, that make you a climate change ambassador. And, and if you want some of those buttons, we can have them sent to you. Uh, make sure you make presentations of this PowerPoint. If you want the PowerPoint, we'll send it to you in a form that you can, you can mush around and make it comfortable for you to present but you need to get out and share it with others in, in the community so that they become ambassadors also. Buy or lease an electric car and install the solar panels. Uh, that's really important to do. Don't buy another petroleum powered vehicle. If you do, in 10 years, you won't be able to sell it because nobody's gonna want petroleum vehicles because the gas stations will be closing and, and uh, they're, they're so much more expensive to, to operate and maintain than the electric vehicles. So buy, buy your electric vehicle, rent it if you, if you need to, and, uh, and, and join, the, join the fight for the future. If you can't do these things, even if you can, pray for a future for our children. Let me close with that and invite you to ask questions. These, these are the resources. Uh, opportunities. There's emails that you can communicate through, some telephone numbers to the most important ones, and they can give you the information necessary to begin accomplishing this transition. Let's let's uh, go now back to the <clears throat> the map, if we could. Most of the questions will relate to the map, and <clears throat> I'll answer any questions you have in the most honest way I can and, and uh, see if we can get this program going to, uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, and we'll springboard off these questions with answers to your questions. Um, Gloria, I think you were going to ask the questions or is, did, was Barbara able to join us? Um, Gloria, I don't see Bar um, Barbara here. Gloria, could you ask the questions? Is she mute? Is she on mute? 
Yeah, she's here. She but she's muted. She has to turn there on go. her. There, there she is. There I go. I can't seem to turn on the video, but at least my uh, audio is going. Um, Rod, thank you very much for those uh, very detailed information and slides. Um, and uh, appreciate your being here. If this is something that the league has indeed um, been very interested in and uh, involved with. And um, I'm glad to see that our two co-chairs of our climate change committee uh, are both with us, um, uh, 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 Judy Chamberlain and Virginia um, Holtz. Um, let me get to some of the questions that were prepared ahead Laurie, of time. Laurie, from, could I interrupt uh, you just to, may I interrupt sure. just a minute? to say that I really applaud the league for being way out front on this a decade before the rest of the world found this to be a problem. Uh, and one of the most proud moments of my life was when I retired from the County Board of Supervisors in 1995, the league made me an honorary member. And I still value that, that honorary relationship and I'm happy to help anytime I can. Thank you so much, Rod. We really um, admire all the work you've done, especially in the transportation area. And um, so uh, let me just start with this question. Um, we know that COVID really impacted our, our lives, but it's fearful, it, it really hurt public transportation. Would you speak about that? And um, how do we recover from that? I think is one of the questions. How much has COVID hurt public transportation and do you see recovery happening? Gloria? And, and in Virginia, and uh, I forgot your other chair. Uh, Judy. Judy, thank you for your leadership. Uh, the uh, First of all, highway traffic is coming back. It's worse than it was now. The, yes, before, it is. <laughs> before the pandemic, I looked on my screen, on my uh, traffic uh, screen uh, on the Tesla coming home yesterday, and it looked like a bowl of red spaghetti with all of the all of the major highways being in condition red, which meant they were stop side, stop start traffic. And this was a little, a little before five o'clock. And that continues on through to, to 6, 630. Every afternoon now, every morning in Silicon Valley. Now, people are going to put up with that, not for very long. And they're going to start going back to mass transportation, especially as mass transportation becomes proven to be safe. Right now, we're ultra concerned about, about COVID and the other uh, infectious diseases. But as, as we begin to use mass transit again, and we realize that it does not uh, become a super spreader as it had been at one time because of, of being cleaned up and because the uh, diseases are a little less uh, toxic than they were. Uh, we're going to see people going back to mass transit, not because they want to, but because if they want to get to work, they're going to have to. They're not going to be able to get there in a car. And we can't expand the highway system enough to accommodate the cars. The highway system right now, uh, in California especially, is built out to the sound walls in almost every place. The little areas where we can expand the width of the highways, it only moves the, the uh, bottleneck to another location. So we can't increase our throughput significantly anymore in California. We just don't have the dirt to pave. So the only alternative we have, if we are going to continue to accommodate the significant industrial growth that Silicon Valley is seeing and, and other California locations, is to continue to use mass transportation and to develop a mass transportation that looks a little bit more like Manhattan and a little less like traditional LA. I, I think that uh, sometimes we have to think about personal behavior and, and changing and how we do things. And for example, I know that a lot of people um, are dealing with um, health issues and obesity in this country. And so perhaps more walking and biking is also another part of it. Absolutely. The next question really has to do with public policy, Rod. What do you feel would be the most important things for say those of us in the league and local residents to do in terms of pushing um, either city or county government in terms of developing policies and taking actions that will have some impact 
um, and tied in with this sort of perhaps is sort of the notion, do we need to start thinking about um, asking residents to to give up something or should we ban certain activities? Is, is that a course of action that makes sense to you that we actually impose or, or use our government policies to, to create change in behavior? And, and what do you think? Is there something we should be pushing? It's already happening. Uh, and it's easier here in California than in some of the other areas of the world. But it's already happening in California. Uh, California has declared a code red. That's where you start. San Jose has declared a code red. Santa Clara County has declared a code red on climate change. So they're all ready to do the things that are necessary. Uh, for example, stimulating the use, the installation of solar panels, uh, uh, encouraging the installation, uh, installation of every home and building. Uh, that is being constructed now, eliminating and making it illegal to have natural gas put into the new buildings, instead requiring that all uh, heating be done, heating and uh, cooking and so on, be done by electricity. Now that's being done, it's been adopted in many of the cities already, but it should be adopted un uh, universally by the state, all the counties and all the cities. It's gonna be harder in the remote areas uh, they're more conservative and they're more used to using wood and those kinds of things. That's too bad. Uh, we'll, we have to work with them eventually, but they don't make much difference right now. What makes the difference is the vast amount of the population in the metropolitan areas. If we don't fix it where we live with, with so many millions and millions of people, then we don't care about Alpine County with 30,000 people. Yeah, uh, and, and it varies. I mean, the California is such a diverse state. I mean, and, and you know, we have major metropolitan areas, and then we have large agriculture areas. This is a curious, interesting area. A question: What do you say about the idea of um, uh, individual and pension funds um, re being reviewed and and perhaps changing their investment strategies to support uh, climate uh, good climate action? Um, and I suspect, for example, <laughs> should we be should we use should we use our pension funds or our investments to change the course of corporate behavior? How do you feel about that? And if so, are there some investments, and how do you find them that would be, I guess, climate friendly or, or truly green companies that are doing the right things, as opposed to companies that that are perhaps adding to the greenhouse gas um, emissions? Gloria, the a good investor. A good investment advisor will tell you not to invest in petroleum right now because it's going to go out of business. In the next 10 years, the amount of petroleum we are consuming in the United States is going to drop precipitously because people are concerned about climate change. In, in California, it's already happening. You see gas stations all closing all over the place. And who wants to go down and and be whiplash between four and five and six dollars uh, a gallon for gasoline and have to pay a, a mechanic a lot of money to change your oil and fix your pistons and, and do all the other kinds of things with your gasoline powered car when none of that is required with an electric car. There's just a little electric motor in there that's in permanent uh, lubricated bushings uh, that never requires maintenance. And, and the battery, you charge your, your car when you bring it into your house and, and you plug it in with your home charger if you have a, a home situation uh, or, or you uh, uh, do it with the uh, communal chargers that are being set up now around the state by, by the state of California. So it, it's, it's much less expensive to buy, buy an electric car and that's going to put the petroleum uh, companies out of business as it comes to a petroleum, um, selling petroleum to a gas station. If you buy an elect, if you buy a, a gas powered car right now, in 10 years, you're not gonna be able to sell that car. Nobody's gonna wanna buy it because the gas stations will be closed and, and it's, it's gonna be identified as a polluter. They're gonna look at you and say, you're anti-social uh, person because you're 
driving a, a, a gas powered car and, and hurting the planet when everybody else is, is driving electrics. So if you're a, a thinking investor, you're not gonna want to invest in petroleum companies, in, in uh, gas companies. Um, uh, and, and that should go for our institutional investors too. So the great investment funds that are supporting Stanford and Berkeley and the other Harvard and so on have already made the decision that they're going to divest. They are gradually divesting from petroleum and carbon-based uh, energy in, in, in investments. And it isn't just because of, of climate change. It's also because it's better investment policy to be investing in solar panels, investing in a company that creates solar panels or or um, uh, invents better better batteries or or uh, builds electric cars. There's another whole area of investment opportunities relating to this new electric car industry uh, that we can all be involved with and make a lot of money. Uh, Mr. Tesla will tell you that you make a lot of money supporting electric cars, although he went wacko in the process, apparently. <laughs> But, uh, he, he, but uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> we now are seeing a huge, tremendous growth in electric cars by all of the automakers. They're finally on board with that. Um, and how do you feel about, um, I guess this is sort of a different question that has something to do with um, uh, climate change. What are your thoughts about what society can do to accommodate the millions of people who are being displaced uh, and due to really essentially climate change and, and some of the impacts of climate change that you referred to? Well, this is a tough one because it's only going to get worse. And there are, there are ultimately there will be billion, a billion people uh, who will be upset and uprooted and, and finding uh, a place to live where you and I live. They're going to be coming to where the water is because that's where you can raise a crop and, and, and have a living. Uh, now, we can say, build a wall and keep them out. And that might work for short periods of time, but eventually it won't because you, humanitarian requirements of thinking human beings won't let those people die in the desert down there uh, for very long. And so we've got to figure out a way to accommodate them. Now, the United Nations developed a policy uh, years ago of dividing up the number that each one of the uh, countries should accept based on the, the country's ability to accommodate growth. And we ought to, uh, we ought to be uh, receptive to that. Instead of building walls and, and talking tough and trying to scare people away, we ought to be receptive and saying, we'll take our share uh, and we'll divide those up and send them around to, to different uh, uh, um, sponsors uh, throughout the United States. Many of the churches have sponsoring programs uh, and, uh, and other of the organizations in, in the nation have sponsoring programs in the various cities and, and um, institutionalize that process of accepting uh, folks who are coming through for immigration, uh, taking them through a, an induction process, preparing them for work, and and uh, and then getting them to work in your in your backyard. They can be they can be uh, if they're technically competent. They can work in the technology industry that seriously needs employment now. If they're not technically competent, they can help mow your lawn or or clean your house or do the other kinds of things that you can't find people to do now. But that has to be done. We can't leave people sitting out in the desert and expect the world to accept that for any period of time. I think we, as you pointed out, this is a global issue, code red for, for it's, it's not just the United States, it's, it's, it's something globally that we all need to deal with. And you've done so much uh, to help us think about it, not only as a, a global problem, but also what we can do locally. Thank you so much for your passion, your long-term commitment in this area, your focus on transportation and how to make our transportation system one that will uh, take us away from fossil, um, burning uh, individual vehicles and, and urging uh, support for not only public transportation, but good public transportation. 
Uh, you are a hero to all of us in the league for your work. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I do want to comment to the um, audience that this has been recorded, is being recorded, and so the slides will be available and the recording will be available. And if you have any questions, of course, we will be happy to refer them on to, to, to Rod. But uh, or, I think we Gloria, go back to the individual actions, Rod. <laughs> Gloria, Gloria may, I, may I make a closing statement? Just a one Yes, please. In 10, 15 years, we're going to know how this turns out. And if I'm here, I'm going to go to my now grandbabies who are young adults, and they're going to look me in the eye and they say, Papa, when you had a chance, did you do everything you could do to fight climate change? I'm going to look them back in the eye and say, yes, I did. What will you say? Thank you, Rob, for that challenge for each one of us as individuals. I think that's one that we hope we can meet um, and all we can do. And I know certainly for the league, uh, we're pushing it. We hope to educate ourselves and thank you for helping educate us more. Um, I wanna thank you so much. You've just been fantastic. I'm sorry that uh, Barbara Marshman couldn't join us and that Diane couldn't, but I just wanna thank you so much on behalf of the league for all that you've done. And um, I wanna thank our audience for being with us today to help us uh, expand our network of people who are educated about climate change's impacts and also be thinking hard about what we as individuals can do, what we in the league can do, and what we in our community can do. Um, our next lunch with league will be on Thursday, March 16th. Uh, we'll have San Jose State University Associate Professor and author Dr. Ryan Skinnell, uh, who will talk about something very important to the league, that words matter and the problem with democracy's rhetorical failures because of the words that are not being spoken. So I think that'll be very interesting if we think about how that impacts democracy. And also on April 20, um, our event will be, um, we'll have our lunch of league speaker will be the new San Jose police chief, Anthony Mata. So stay tuned for those upcoming lunch with leagues. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in future lunch with league events. And we will be sending you the links to a copy of this video and some of the materials that Rod has sent us, including we hope to be able to get to, to you the link on the transportation model that we, we weren't able to bring up on the uh, PowerPoint. Once again, thank you, Rod. Thank you all for being with us and um, have a good day.